morning as we come to God's word, would you uh, just ask for the Lord's help this morning with me? Father, this morning we come to your word and we ask that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher this morning. Um, I ask that you'd be with the speaker and that I might be able to hear and listen to you even as you use the words that come from my mouth. Father, may they be uh, the words of your word. May they be guided by your spirit. May we all receive that which you give to us. For what comes from your word is sent and is effective. It accomplishes that for which you send it forth, Father. May we come this morning to receive from you. Having given praise to you, Father, may we open and give you our minds that they may be instructed, our hearts that they may be challenged and encouraged, Father, that you may have all of our lives to use for your glory to accomplish your will. Father, may we grow today more in the image of Jesus Christ as you work among us. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, we are continuing again, still our series, this sort of an overview of, of the Bible, the biblical landscape. And uh, we have looked at the pattern of the kingdom in the garden. We saw how that kingdom pattern perished in the fall. And then we saw the promises had been made and God promised a kingdom to come to establish his people, to establish a place for them, to establish his rule and his blessing. And now we come, uh, having looked at some of those things, we are going to move to what we might call the, the partial kingdom. We began to look at that a little bit last week, and I'd encourage you, if you ever miss uh, a Sunday, don't miss, but if you do miss, uh, go back and, and catch up this sort of, sort of a running theme. And and we want to stand far enough back from the scripture that we, we don't just, when we read the story of, of Moses, we don't just see the, the bulrushes and, and the Pharaoh and some strange plagues and then we move on. We want to see what God is doing throughout all of history because uh, that history, though the part that we're living in uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not written here, we're a part of this. We've always been a part of this. God has always been working out his plan to establish his everlasting kingdom. And so now moving into the partial kingdom, I was seeing the partial fulfillment of God's covenant, of his kingdom promises in the history of Israel. In light of the, the fact that what we, we see progressive revelation, when we say progressive revelation, what we mean is that as God has gone on through time, he has been continuing to reveal more and more of his plan. It has become clearer and clearer. Uh, the plan has always been there. We saw foreshadowings. We saw pictures and types and shadows uh, and the, the lights are continuing to come up. So as we stand here in the New Testament, we stand in, in the greater light. Christ came to be the light. He's the fulfillment of what God's promised. And so standing in the light, we take that light and we shine it back on the Old Testament to see what the picture was pointing to, what was in the shadow. And so to do that, we have been starting in the New Testament to point us backwards. And so if you would join me in John chapter 8, uh, as, you, as you get there, I'm going to start in verse 48. We're going to read a few verses to begin with. But in this passage, Jesus is, in John 8, in uh, uh, probably one of the most heated exchanges he had during his time here that's recorded for us with these Pharisees, with people who were uh, Jews uh, by birth, people who were quite proud of their biological heritage in Abraham, and people who did not appreciate what Jesus was saying, did not appreciate what he was doing, and uh, often argued with him. And uh, in John 8, uh, Jesus declares that he is the light of the world, uh, that the truth will set them free. They, of course, don't think they're in bondage to anybody. He mentions uh, Abraham. He mentions also that uh, these people are not children of Abraham as they uh, think they are. We've, we've seen that and I won't recap that, but we saw in the last couple of messages uh, who the children of Abraham truly are. And he tells them then uh, quite curtly that they are children of the devil, something I think they're probably not accustomed to hearing. So in verse 48, we continue to, to look in on this heated conversation. And the Jews answer him, are we not right in saying that you are Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Do you make yourself, who, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. That's not a grammatical error. Jesus wasn't making a mistake of subject-verb agreement. Jesus was declaring very clearly, as he did, uh, John clearly recorded, I think it is seven different times where Jesus used the phrase, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, I'm hoping that that rings a bell from your Sunday school days, and if you don't have those, then you're, you're about to uh, learn one of the greatest things that we ever had revealed to us by the Lord. But notice here in this passage, the question is not what Jesus is doing. They are caught up with what he's doing and what he's saying. Jesus makes it clear. The issue is not what I did or what I said. The question is who I am. And who you say you come from, the question is who you know or rather who you don't know. You don't know God. That is the problem. That's what he tells them. They did not know who God was. Jesus knows God and Jesus is God and he uses God's personal name. John's big point in in this whole book, which he makes clear towards the end, is, is to prove that Jesus is who he said he was, that he was the son of God. And the fact that he includes these I am statements, it's significant. So now then, as we, with that in mind, Start to look at the partial kingdom. We're covering a part of history. As we sort of turn back to the beginning, right? This is pointing us backwards. That's what I, I hope to do. As we stand in the New Testament, we stand on this side of the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we look back at the Old Testament and we wonder what's going on there. What God is telling us about himself. We come to the, 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 the section we've entitled the partial kingdom. And this covers Abraham to Solomon. So it's about a thousand years worth of history. So we spent a lot of time in Genesis, but that lays the foundation for so many things. We're going to start to pick up now. And if you were uh, frustrated that we were going too slow, you may be frustrated that we go too fast later. Again, we'll, we'll come back to this in detail at another time, God willing. We're, we're taking the short, uh, or the long view, I should say. So from Genesis 12 to about Exodus 18, that's about the first half of Exodus, we see that, of the, of the three, and, and what we come to find out is four aspects of God's promise to Abraham. God promised a people, he promised a land, and he promised blessing. We're going to find out later that he also promised a king. So there are really four parts to the blessing that God promises to Abraham. And from Genesis 12 to 18, we see the fulfillment of the people of God start to come to pass. From Exodus 19 through about Leviticus, we see God's rule and blessing being established. And then from about Numbers to Joshua, what we have there is the conquest. That's the partial fulfillment of the land promise to the people of God. And then from Judges through Second Chronicles, we have the record of the partial fulfillment of the king promise. So again, God is partially fulfilling these things. They're not ultimately the fulfillment. We know that that's in Jesus Christ. We've discussed that at length and we'll continue to bring that up because he's, he's the central character. He's the theme of the book. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so although we've, all, we've already looked at the, uh, the, the uh, construction or the bringing to pass of the people of God, uh, we're going to look more at the historical development of that. 
So I want you to notice some of the characters that we have here. We, we've talked about Abraham. Of course, they were super old, right? And so God chooses them as old to have the child of promise, right? He didn't, he didn't come to Abraham when he was young and give Isaac to them then. He didn't count Ishmael as the one that was going to work. No, he told Abraham at 75, you're going to have a kid. Sarah laughs. He waits till they're about 100 years old, the Bible says, until their bodies were as good as dead. And then he gives them the child. Why? It's a miraculous birth. It's, it's going to take a miracle. And God does that on purpose to prove that it's he who is at work and not human means. But then we get Isaac, whose name means laughter, right? Sarah laughed. Abraham kind of laughed this off, but there he is. Then you get to Genesis 22. And seemingly, as soon as we've gotten off the ground here, uh, God asks something huge of Abraham and that is to sacrifice Isaac. And we're going to come back to this, but just to kind of get a scope as we kind of zoom in step at a time. Uh, and then from Isaac, we go to Jacob. Jacob was not a great guy. His name makes that clear even. Uh, there's something to be learned by the fact that Jacob was the one who was chosen by God. Then we get to Joseph also. He was kind of a little brat, had a horrible uh, life growing up, but finds himself there as second in command and sent ahead to preserve the people of God. And then we have what God promised Abraham, which was not one of the good things that God promised him. We have 400 years of slavery for the children of Israel. And I think overall the point that God is, is making is that it's going to take a miracle for the gospel to be fulfilled in the life of any person. It's going to take a miracle for God to fulfill the gospel promise. This is not something that man can pull off this is not something we can do for ourselves by our wisdom, by our strength. It's going to take a miracle. And throughout history, God has accomplished these extraordinary things in very ordinary lives. So let's go quickly then. As we, as we look through this section here, we're going to finish Genesis and we're going to start Exodus. The story of the fulfillment of the gospel promise is a story of one miracle after another. We mentioned Abraham and Sarah. But I want to take a look at, at, at the idea of Isaac for a minute. You'll find that story in Genesis 22. I'm going to make my way to the back uh, to see what the New Testament has to say about that. But if you are not familiar with that story, I'd encourage you to go read Genesis 22. And uh, look at what happens. Here's the short story. Isaac is born. Uh, God comes to Abraham and says, all right, I want you to take your son, Isaac, your only son whom you love, right? Let's not be, let's not, uh, be mistaken here. I don't mean Ishmael. Uh, I mean Isaac, that one, that boy. I want you to take him. I want you to go to a mountain I'm going to show you. On, on that mountain, I want you to sacrifice him to me. And we don't have any record of any argument on the part of Abraham. He seems to be okay with it, though I think you get glimpses. Here's the man who's more wealthy than, than most people in this region at the time, for sure. And he's getting up early on his own to chop his own wood. Maybe it's that he couldn't sleep. I don't know. Nevertheless, what we see is this man get up, get his things, take his son, and go to that mountain. And when he leaves his servants behind to take Isaac to this mountain, he tells them they will be back. On the way up the mountain, Isaac is wondering, I see the wood. I see everything really that we need except for the lamb. And Abraham's words are that God will provide. Jehovah Jireh. And we know that that is exactly what happened. Abraham had Isaac tied up, had him on the altar, had the, the knife in the air. And God stops him. He says, now I know. I've seen it. You're going to trust me. You're going to be faithful. You're going to obey what I tell you to obey. And I think when we read that, we find ourselves in that same spot. How many times we don't always understand when we are in the middle of the trial, when we are in the middle of the test, we're in the middle of all these circumstances and we do not have a clue what God could possibly be doing because this does not seem like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It doesn't seem like blessing. And we just wonder, what is, what is going on? And we always have the same options every time. We have the same options that Abraham had. One, 
I don't understand. I'm filled with pain. I'm filled with grief. And I will resent you, God, for the rest of my life for putting me in this spot or for not giving this thing to me or for not making this clear or easier for me. And I know people. They've had difficult lives. Yet they have a belief that God exists. Innately, they have an understanding that God is in control, but they resent God for the life that he has given to them. Our other option is I do not understand, I am filled with grief, I am filled with pain, but I will trust you in the middle of this. Those are always our options, loved ones. Those were Abraham's options. Then you get to Jacob. Oh, pardon me, let me back up. Hebrews. How does the New Testament look back on this episode? Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. God, I don't get it. I don't understand. I am filled with grief that I am about to put a knife into my son, my only son whom I love, the one you promised to make this happen for me and for my offspring. And the Bible says his faith was such that he reckoned that if it was necessary, God could raise him from the dead. And in fact, figuratively speaking, he did. Seems like a thing that God does. It would take a miracle. Then we get to Jacob. Jacob should not have been chosen. Jacob was the younger. Jacob's name even means deceiver. This was not, this was not a good guy. He didn't have a lot of uh, good character traits. Really, it should have been Esau as the older one. It should have been somebody more trustworthy, surely. Somebody more honest dealing, somebody more upright, somebody with a little bit of character, surely. That's the kind of guy that God wants to choose to continue to, to bring about the, the, the people of God and the blessing of God. No, he chooses Jacob. And he tells Rebecca this is going to happen. And what do we learn about God? Well, I think as we saw when we looked at Ephesians 1 and that God has this eternal purpose, he's working from eternity to eternity, God's choice is not based on human merit. God's choice is not based on any characteristics of ourselves, anything that we are or have or do or would do. None of those things. I think Paul makes this abundantly clear to us so that we can make no mistake about it in Romans 9 Paul mentions this very business about Jacob and Esau, and he mentions in Romans 9, starting in verse 6, but it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I'm going to pause that, that just a second. We just, we just heard the author of Hebrews quote that very same verse. Did we know? I hope, loved ones, that you're following along. And I hope that as we go through these New Testament, you are seeing time and time again how much it points back to the old. That this is the same God on the same plan and that we are benefited. I, I hope that you are. I have been just through this study and seeing this as one book. One book, one God, one promise, one plan, one kingdom, one king, one faith, one hope, all of this tied together. I hope that you're, you're blessed by this. Romans 9, verse 8, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca she, uh, had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, that is Rebecca, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? 
God, that's not fair. Isn't that, that's how we would say it. That doesn't seem fair. You just picked Jacob. He was a rotten kid. He was a rotten brother. He was a mama's boy. He tricked his dad to get something that didn't belong to him. His mother helped him. She aided and abetted the whole thing. He's a sneaky little guy. What's so wrong with... Hey, so he's hairy, right? He's a manly guy. God said, no, it's this way. It's completely opposite of what you'd think it would be. Why? So that it would be clear that it is God who chooses and he does not choose based on merit. He does not choose based on who you are, where you come from, what you did, do, or would do. Why? That's not fair. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. It doesn't seem like that in English because we'd use stronger words, but that's a pretty strong phrase. Paul's making it super clear. Absolutely not. God forbid. God is not unjust. He is not unfair. He is not unrighteous. He is not capricious, arbitrary. He is not malicious. But he knows what we're thinking because he knows what he just said. For he says to Moses, that's where we're going to get today, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And in fact, that's a verb. What he's really saying, I will mercy who I will mercy. Mercy is mine to give. And I will give it where I give it. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, oh, sorry, that's where we end there in verse 16. I encourage you to read the rest of that. It's good to have a bigger context there. But God makes it super clear what he's doing. Therefore, if I marvel and rejoice that he's poured out his love upon me, that he's adopted me, I hope it's not based on merit because I am fully aware of my complete lack of merit. There's nothing I could do that is not tainted and marred and scarred by my own sinful flesh. And if it depended on me to do something to catch God's attention, I would be hopelessly lost. So that grace is really grace and mercy is really mercy because if it's earned, it's justice. And if we were to get justice from God, we would be in hell because what we deserve, like James said, anyone who breaks the law at one point is guilty of breaking the entire thing. A lawbreaker is a lawbreaker, period. So then God does not leave it up to us to deserve grace. By definition, it cannot be deserved. And I'm not to marvel or complain that apparently God did not choose Esau. I am to lift my hands and bow my head that I have been adopted. What did, what did, what did, John, what did John say? 1 John 3, right at the very beginning of 1 John 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That is the point, to know who God is. And we get to Joseph. Now you, you, maybe you, you know that story. <laughs> he wakes up, he's got this dream, he kind of rubs his brother's face in it. Listen, you, you know, right, you're going to be bowing down to me. They're not real keen on that. They want to kill him. Reuben says, no, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him off and tell dad he died. And, you know, whatever. He'll be sad, but he'll get over it. But we don't got to listen to his mouth anymore. He goes. He's a servant. He's wrongly accused. He's thrown in prison. Some guys are like, yeah, I'll remember you. I'll get you out. They forget about him. God keeps him there. Then Pharaoh has a dream. God gives Joseph the ability to interpret that dream. Next thing you know, he's second in command over all of Egypt. He is told that a famine is coming through these dreams. And he prepares. God sends him ahead. Because then what happens is that famine actually comes. Jacob, his dad, and his family, his family, his brothers, all those people, they come to Egypt to survive. And so there's food waiting for them in Egypt. But the whole time up to that, I have to think that, God, that, Jake, that Joseph is wondering, what? Are you in control or not here? Because... I mean, I get that my brothers were upset. When I told them that dream. I kind of thought this was going to go better. I mean, I saw this going differently, God, right? But, but here I am in prison. 
here I am having to run from that crazy lady in Potiphar's house, but I'm here in prison anyway, even though I did what I was supposed to do. I didn't touch her. I, I did the right thing, God, and, and here I am, languishing in prison, being forgotten. Are you really in control? And I think the thing that you see in Genesis here is that God is absolutely in control. What we learn about God here is that he is in control. We discover that he always overrules to bring about the fulfillment of his promises. And though they are often mysterious, and sometimes they are hidden, God's ways are always good. They are always loving. They are always righteous. And that brings us to the end of Genesis. Well, then we, we start Exodus now. And what do we start with? We start with a group of people who are in slavery. Hundreds of years, but they have grown to be a massive group of people. The Egyptians are now scared of them. Uh, the people have forgotten Joseph, forgotten where he came from. And no doubt these Hebrew people here then harbored a great deal of doubt about what God was up to. Maybe even doubting who he was. Maybe some had forgotten who he was. It's clear from the way they reacted beyond this that some of them had forgotten who he was. But then God raises up an individual through which he would again, by miraculous means, accomplish his purposes. In Exodus 2, we see Moses being born. You have some faithful midwives there. In Exodus 3, we have the burning bush. Moses encounters God. In verse 7, we read, The Lord uh, said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. God sees. He hears his people. You are his people. We are his people. He still sees you. He still hears you. He knows your suffering. He knows your heartache. He knows when our patience wanes. In verse 10 there of Exodus 3, God says, come, I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? But he said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and they say to them, the God of your fathers, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, notice that's in all caps. That's unique, that's special. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Especially when I stand in front of you and tell you before Abraham was, I am. I think we learn a lot of things. But the question is always, what do they tell us about God? Moses doubts himself. I can't do what you want me to do because of who I am or who I'm not. And God says, no, it's not about who you are, Moses. It's about who I am. And when God figures out who Moses, sorry, when Moses figures out who God is, then it's bring it on, Pharaoh. But it's not until Moses focuses on who God is and not on who Moses is. Well, then you can see there, as we read always, and, and then uh, in chapter 6, 2 through 8, God recounts this business of his promises to the people of Israel, this covenant to do those things that he promised to Abraham. In, seven to, uh, in, in chapter 7, verse 5, God purposes to make himself known by his actions. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and shall bring my people out from among them. That name, I am who I am, it's, un it's unpronounceable. They even refuse to pronounce it. When you see L-O-R-D in all caps, that's sort of where we got to, right? Sometimes we have added vowels. We came up with the word Jehovah. Some modern translations have added other vowels and that's where we get the name Yahweh. But this is God. 
And his name tells us, in a sense, that it cannot be encapsulated by any human meaning or understanding. We are going to have to see what this God does to know something about who he is. And Pharaoh does not know who God is. And God says, I'll show you who I am by what I do. I'll show you exactly who I am, and you will know exactly who whom you're dealing with. And so you get to Exodus 7 to 11. We have the plagues and we see God's mighty power. You get to Exodus 12 and you get the Passover. And what do we learn about God? We learn that God saves, but he saves by substitution. He saves his own by substituting another. So that when John says, as he sees Jesus coming down the bank of the river Jordan, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the world's sin. When you see Paul in, 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 in Corinthians say that Christ is our Passover. When you see Jesus at the Passover in the upper room say, this is my body. God saves by substitution. Then you get to Exodus 14, you get the Red Sea, and you see that God makes a spectacle of his enemies. We're reminded of Colossians, where Paul says that God put the, the, the powers and authorities to public shame on the cross, that on the cross, God made a spectacle of the devil. He made a spectacle of sin. He made a spectacle of every evil thing on the cross, just like God made a spectacle of the Pharaoh in that Red Sea. I'll tell you who I am. I'll bring you down to this ocean and I'll bury you for my glory because that is who I am. These are my people. I have set them free. You no longer have any claim to them. And when Christ is on the cross, he tells sin and he tells the devil, these are my people. You have no more claim over them. And to prove that I am who I am, I'm going into the grave myself and I'm coming out again. And he did. And God put sin and Satan and self to public shame on the cross. This is what that points forward to. It really happened. It's a historical fact. But it does point forward. And what do we learn about God is that God delivers. He is always at work accomplishing his will. Romans 15 tells us in verse 4 that what was written in the past for us, what was written, what for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hasn't that been our theme? We might have hope as we all get bogged down and overwhelmed in the middle of all our trials and our tests and our circumstances. We have the grace of God's revelation of himself so that throughout all history, all eternity, we know that God's been faithfully working as fulfilling his promises. Therefore, we have reason to believe and to have hope, not simply because of what God has done, but because of whom God is and what those actions reveal by his character, his power, his purpose. If we don't stand far enough back from the Bible to see and to understand what God is doing, then we will not have stood far enough back to understand who God is. We get consumed in these details and we miss this God who is from cover to cover. The primary purpose of Scripture is the revelation of who God is, the unfolding not just of his work of salvation, but of his character. We read our Bibles and we ask maybe too often, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my life today? How is this going to help me do this better or that better? And it's not an irrelevant question. The, the scripture certainly speaks to our conduct and our way of going about life every day. But the primary question ought to be, when we read our Bibles, what does this tell me about who God is? How well are we doing with our mountains and countless numbers of self-help and how-to books in the Christian world that are marketed, how to be a better husband, how to better manage your finances, how to do this better and that better. How is that working out for us? Does the church look different than the rest of the world because we have all the know-how to do all these things? I suggest to you, it doesn't look any different at all. And it's not because we don't know how to do these things. It's because we've forgotten who God is. We've forgotten who this almighty creator is. Who puts kingdoms down and raises them up for his own glory and for the good of his people. Pharaoh 
You think you're the top in the world and I'm sure everyone else thinks you are, but I am the Lord God. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. And I will put you where I want you for my glory and my purpose, which is always good, and always righteous and always holy. And I will not share my glory with another. This God who then condescends is born to a humble family lives a miraculous life, clear as day who he was, innocent and perfect, and then lays down on a cross to claim his victory and comes out of the grave to extend that to the objects of his grace, to the objects of his mercy. That God, in a sense, is both above and beyond and near. And once Moses knew then who God was, he could do what God commanded. How many of our problems, our trials, our circumstances, how many of our sins seem daunting, seem intimidating, seem impossible to overcome? And by human standards, they are. They are completely outside of our scope, of our power, our wisdom, our ability but in light of who God is, in light of his character, his power, his purpose, our problems pale by comparison. He may not always take the course of action that I would like or that I would choose or that you would choose, but I can trust that he is always at work in accordance with his supreme wisdom, his divine power, his good and perfect will, his love towards his children. And when I am in the middle of it, and I don't know what's going on, My need to know what to do and what he's doing and if I'm okay should rest squarely on the revelation of who God is and that he does not change. And the God who did those things is the same God who was with me every day. In every way. And I don't know what or how but I know who. And if you know who, he is our hope. He is our peace. He is our future. He is our joy. He is our rock, our salvation, our redeemer. He is the glory of all glories. Amen.